This entire episode will heavily discuss sex trafficking of both adults and minors, as well as sexual assault. Please click away if you find mentions of these topics upsetting. Thank you. When the internet was just starting to explode in popularity around the turn of the millennia, sites like Craigslist, AOL, Yahoo, and eventually MySpace took the world by storm. Many of you probably wouldn't recognize the internet from two decades ago, but that's not just because of the websites themselves changing. It's also due to the laws around how we use the internet adapting and shaping our online experience today. One of the largest and most controversial websites from the early internet, which later became a catalyst for this law changing was Backpage. This was in many ways, a sort of red light districts of the internet. It was essentially the old classifieds that you'd see in newspapers, just in internet form. You could get car parts, gig work, and rentals. Posting these ads was free and easy to do, so it's not hard to see the appeal. Again, a fairly similar concept to a Craigslist for all intents and purposes. However, Backpage also had an adult section that was only a click of a, yes, I'm an 18 plus button away. It only cost $2 to make a post there. And though the terms of the site did not allow for unlawful, harmful, or obscene content, people certainly jumped rope with that line. According to Wired, some of the titles were laden with innuendo, like one that read, come C-U-M, lay your hot dog on my bun for Memorial Day. And I don't think it takes too much effort to decipher what that one was implying. Now others were just blunt and didn't seem to hide anything at all. Like another that read three holes, anything goes $90. So you might be wondering how the hell was this allowed? Well, the short answer, section 230. Basically section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which was passed in 1996, protects websites from getting sued because of what their users say. If someone makes horrific death threats on Twitter, you can't go suing Twitter yourself. You would have to go after the person making the threats. This immunized online platforms from liability to the point where Backpage said, hey, it's not our fault if our platform is being used this way. Go after our users for the illegal stuff, not us. Section 230 is pretty controversial in of itself. And I'm sure as you can imagine, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Now this method did work for a while, but not forever. In fact, this all came to a dramatic catastrophic head when the website was seized and one of the founders of Backpage ended up staring down the barrel of a gun. He and his fellow founder were both arrested for facilitating human trafficking. So how did we get here? And was Backpage just a sleazy black market all along? Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we're gonna be talking about Backpage. Were they just a community of like-minded people, a red light district of the internet, a dangerous placement for trafficking or none of these things at all? To answer that question, let's briefly take a look at founders, Michael Lacey and James Larkin. Two of them were fierce advocates for the right to free speech, not holding back any punches when it came to their criticism. Lacey was a newspaper editor and Larkin a publisher. Articles have referred to them as, quote, mix from the sticks who made a fortune thumbing their shanty Irish snouts at authority. And I don't really fully know what that means, but I assume putting their nose somewhere and snubbing it at authority, I don't know. But the point is with an attitude like that, it's no surprise that Larkin and Lacey were sued 56 times between 1997 and 2012, which is quite an accomplishment, but they actually won every suit brought against them too. The pair even settled a nearly $4 million case against Joe Arpaio, a notoriously anti-immigrant sheriff in Maricopa County. In that case, Larkin and Lacey had been arrested on suspicion of violating the secrecy of grand jury matters after writing critical articles about Arpaio, insisting the then county sheriff and prosecutor violated the constitution. The bogus charges were dropped and it slowly came to light how Arpaio brutally tormented prisoners in Maricopa County, earning him the nickname, the cruelest sheriff in America, and at the prison itself, Hitler. Lacey and Larkin seemed heroic for standing up against him and condemning this, even if it meant that they faced undeserved consequences for doing so. One of their longtime advisors, attorney Don Moon stated, their brand was always, fuck you, we don't have friends, we have lawyers. This approach suited them damn well when print was big. In 2001, they owned 11 papers together, which brought in about $100 million each year. But as the internet started to grow, the pair realized the next big thing wasn't on print, but on our screens. And Backpage was born just a few years later. Although you may know of Backpage because of its scandals, they were far from the only website at the time with portions of their website full of NSFW advertisements. Did you know that at one point in time, Craigslist had an adult section? 
finding workers and being a sex worker online was a lot more accessible in those days. And of course, now in current times, there is OnlyFans, but I'm not talking about pornography, but the exchange of sex itself for money. My Red Book was especially popular in the San Francisco area for this. And another similar domain, My Pink Book, was a message board for sex workers to share information with one another. For example, if an escort was assaulted or unpaid by a client, they could warn others to keep the community a bit safer. These sites didn't just give sex workers a place to offer their services and make money, but they were a resource for those in the industry. Around 2010, options began to dwindle. Craigslist closed its erotic services section after pressure from law enforcement and Backpage experienced massive growth as a result. The CEO, Carl Ferrer, sent an email at the time reading, Craig killed his adult section last night in all US markets. It is an opportunity for us. Also a time when we need to make sure our content is not illegal. Backpage surged and had 50% growth in ad volume within just two months, but soon state attorneys turned their eyes onto Backpage, asking them to do what Craigslist had just done and start closing the adult advertising sections. Backpage though, took a bit of a different approach from Craigslist. Now, Backpage didn't want to close down their adult section, but they also didn't want to sit by and do nothing either. So Backpage began working with law enforcement. According to AZ Central, they contracted with a California-based company to hire workers in India who would moderate its ads, about 50 or 60 moderators at their peak, sifting through roughly 14,000 ads per day. They banned nude photographs, had a list of inappropriate terms to use in vetting these advertisements, and the CEO, Ferrer, started to work alongside authorities. But that wasn't enough. See, it wasn't just illegal sex work that was a problem for Backpage. The biggest issue was the sex trafficking of minors. Wired explained that one 14 year old girl had been pimped out on the website and claimed that the website, quote, failed to investigate for fear of what it would learn. However, as we mentioned before, section 230 basically gave Backpage full immunity here and she needed to sue the one that had actually trafficked her. Did they deserve this immunity? Maybe not, but Backpage didn't seem to be afraid for long. Instead of staying in the dark, they decided to dive headfirst into it in a rather unique way. They retained He-Man Shu, a former federal prosecutor who specialized in sex crimes and child abuse to develop a holistic safety program. He was also on the board of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and he was crucial in getting some of these changes off the ground. He explained that words like Lolita might indicate illegal activity. In this case, I assume that would be sex acts with someone under age. Backpage transformed behind the scenes. Though they may have insisted upon keeping their adult section, they didn't turn away from the disturbing underbelly and sex trafficking. Instead, they became instrumental in catching people. The founder and director of Children of the Night, an organization that rescues children from sexual exploitation explains, if law enforcement sees a guy take a girl into a motel, they can't necessarily go into that motel without probable cause. But could they call Backpage to get the guy's ID and see if he's a parolee and get his credit card information and identify who he is? And Backpage said, we could be happy to do that. The vice cops loved it and they used it and they called them all the time. Robert Mueller, then director at the FBI, even awarded Carl Ferrer for his outstanding cooperation and assistance in connection with an investigation of great importance. And yes, that Mueller is in fact the same Mueller as the man who was investigating Russian interference with the 2016 election, in case you were wondering. Now, the numbers seem to prove that what they were doing was working. Out of all the child trafficking reports that went through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children between 2013 and 2017, Backpage was involved in about 75% of them. In 2017 alone, the center had about 10,000 cases. So at the time, this would have been over 7,000 cases that Backpage had a hand in. In a way, this reminds me of To Catch a Predator or other sting operations that have been set up. There are key differences between them absolutely, but with these kinds of numbers, I feel like their importance as a middleman can't be understated. Now, I don't know exactly how many kids they may have rescued as a result of this. However, those that worked to save children seem to respect what they were doing. Lois Lee, law enforcement, and the FBI stood by Backpage, as well as Liz McDougall. Liz claimed that she left her job as a lawyer litigating high profile internet and cybercrime cases and providing pro bono services to help victims of abuse, including human trafficking. And she left that position in favor of the general counsel for Village Voice Media Holdings, the owner of Backpage. According to Liz, if you're going to fight online crimes such as this, you need to be online in the first place. She states, quote, 
I didn't leave a successful law partnership to sit on my hands and verbally defend a company accused of making money on illegal activity. I chose to work with Village Voice Media because of its active engagement to fight human trafficking and the opportunity to help it and the online industry do more. Backpage, as far as I can initially see, did much more than just cooperate, and I wanna give credit where credit is due here. I've spoken about Facebook's role in genocide before, about right-wing social media apps and their disgusting speech. So we're used to seeing giant websites and titans of tech do absolutely nothing to respond to concerns. Whether or not you believe in decriminalizing sex work and regardless of how you feel about the adult ads, I think we can all agree that at least going after those that were trafficking children and having a point of contact like Backpage is crucial. They responded to almost all law enforcement subpoenas within 24 hours or less. They voluntarily collected and submitted additional evidence to law enforcement. And seriously, I don't know about you, but I never hear about social media sites or any websites for that matter doing something like this. But if Backpage was so pivotal, then how did Lacey end up with a gun in his face in 2018? What changed? Now, a lot of this wasn't just Backpage, but scandals in big tech. Misinformation was rampant online in 2016, and Section 230 as a whole was thrown into question. Some, like the editorial board at Washington Post, believe that 230 doesn't need to be revoked, just revised. Harvard Business Review says that it needs updating as it was put place in 1996, and we've learned a lot since then, like the scope and harm that social media can actually cause. Lawmakers have advocated for repealing it entirely to hold big tech accountable, but CBS reports that 230 has allowed new companies and self-expression to thrive on the internet. To say that Section 230 is wholly bad or good would be a downright falsehood. It's a complicated, nuanced thing. But for Backpage, some of these changes would leave them pretty exposed. More than that, it would leave them liable. The major laws passed that would somewhat reduce the power of Section 230 were FOSTA-SESTA passed by Trump in 2018 and it stated that website publishers can be responsible if third parties are found to post ads for prostitution on their website. The fallout from this impacted the sex work community immediately. Within hours, subreddits like r slash escorts, r slash sugar daddy were taken down. Sex workers also found that all online spaces they had used to keep safe were vanishing. Research was on their side and even proved that yes, vetting clients online was safer and actually came with a whole host of benefits that those in the industry may not consider. For one, it allowed sex workers to not need agencies or pimps that might be exploitative. Plus, it gave them more time to think about meeting with a client, more time and space before getting in a car. One study suggested that these preventative measures could be linked to a drop in homicide rates among women. And that is of course, with the exception of homicides where the woman knew their killer. In cities where Craigslist erotic services had been rolled out, the rates dropped between one and 17.6%. And yeah, you heard that right, as much as 17%. The issue I have with the way FOSTA SESTA was presented and the way Section 230 was treated is that the narrative, in my opinion, of course, seemed to be that stopping all sex work online is the answer to solving sex trafficking. And the truth is nothing could be further from it. Sex trafficking is going to happen, whether Backpage exists or not. Exploitation and abuse of sex workers is a problem. Also, regardless of Backpage existing or not, banning erotic ads on Craigslist or sites like Backpage or anything isn't the solution. It merely pushes these cases into the shadows. One stripper and sex worker that spoke to Reason TV, Susie Q, told them that in the days after Backpage fell, many sex workers were hit up by pimps because they couldn't make their money and advertisements anymore. Some were even willing to take on clients that they knew had a tendency to be abusive or had assaulted them because they needed to make rent money. And that's real life, she says. That's what people like me are facing right now. It's not hypothetical, it's real. And right now, it seems pretty clear where I stand. So let me just take a moment to play devil's advocate despite the fact that I fucking hate doing it and present the case that was brought against Backpage. Multiple senators, you may recognize names like John McCain and Kamala Harris in particular. They argued in a 2017 Senate hearing that Backpage wasn't the advocate they presented themselves as. They claimed that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children had reported an 846% increase in suspected child trafficking from 2010 to 2015. They too pointed out that Backpage was linked to 75% of reports they received. As an aside, this hearing had a few issues of its own. Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore, founders of the nonprofit called Thorn, pushed the statistic within the media that between 100 and 300,000 kids are sex slaves in the United States. And this is actually just a patently false statistic. 
The number was meant to represent how many kids may be at risk of exploitation. And the definition of exploitation within the study ranged from trafficking to stripping, to consensual homosexual relations, to even just watching porn. One of the researchers that actually conducted the study said that the number of minors abducted is not nearly as high as Kutcher was implying, estimating the number to be in the hundreds. National Human Trafficking Hotline statistics have shown jumps in recent years, and the NCMEC's best estimates have been in the thousands. While this is still a terrifying problem and still something that we should be aware of, if you're going to work in anti-trafficking and testify about it before Congress, you might just wanna have your facts straight. But anyway, the Senate argument was that Backpage was directly behind this rise in trafficking. 80% of commercial sex advertising in the United States for 2013 went to Backpage. So they had a huge hand in anything that went on within the sex industry. Maybe as sick as this sounds, the market of child trafficking had already existed, That's true, but Backpage was widening that market supposedly. They also insisted that the measures Backpage had taken were far from enough and that Ferrer hadn't wanted to piss off customers by rejecting ads for illegal activity. After all, they may have automatically deleted words like Lolita or teen, but at the end of the day, when about 70 to 80% of their ads had some sort of editing in 2010, it seems to be a foundational problem. Backpage was painted as the villain. What did it matter if they were helping the FBI if they were the cause of the problem, right? One senator in particular seemed especially determined to take Backpage down, and that was Kamala Harris. She called them the world's top online brothel and even had Ferrer, Larkin, and Lacey arrested with pimping or conspiracy to commit pimping back in 2016. The charges were dropped citing the First Amendment, but not before the arrests made her look like a knight in shining armor before the election season. As one portion of the Reason TV documentary explains, Harris gets to have her name in all the papers right before the election saying that she's the one who helped take down these people that everyone for years has been characterizing as these big evil sex traffickers. It was a publicity stunt. She knew that section 230 barred her from making these charges, but she brought them anyway. Was this a case of Harris being over enthusiastic to shut Backpage down and being reckless or a publicity stunt? We'll get more into this later and why I personally believe this Backpage takedown became such a spectacle. Fast forward to these FOSTA-SESTA laws, and now Backpage was seized. Section 230 didn't protect them anymore, and that brings us to Lacey staring down the barrel of a gun by FBI agents. The same government agency that once congratulated his site for being so cooperative. The same FBI whose director awarded and recognized the site's CEO as an asset. Lacey claims that when he was arrested, FBI agents stormed his home and even cuffed his 76-year-old mother-in-law after ordering her out of the shower at gunpoint. They seized absolutely everything. Just a couple of years prior to this, the three men were untouchable until in 2018, it all completely fell apart. But did they deserve it? Backpage can be held accountable for the women they say were sexually abused and exploited at their website's hands. Some victims state that they were raped, advertised by their own family members, choked and other horrific brutal acts. Melanie Thompson, the youth outreach coordinator at the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women was kidnapped and exploited at only 12 years old. She remembers exactly what it was like to sit and watch while her exploiter typed up ads about her to post on Backpage. Thompson told why. The ads would start with whatever name I was given for the day. It would describe my measurements. So my bust size, my hip size, my pant size, and my bra size. When I was street walking, it was dangerous. Don't get it twisted. But at least I could see the face of somebody from the car. And what I found is that because Backpage made it so easy for sex buyers to continue this behavior repeatedly, many of the sex buyers I'd encountered on this website were repeat offenders, she said. And that seemed to instill in them a sense of dangerous entitlement. Thompson describes the violence she endured and how she was treated as disposable at the hands of her abusers. They were brazen and especially cruel because according to Thompson, they knew that they could easily find another girl in a different ad. Backpage may have done a lot to stop child trafficking, but it's hard to really measure the help and harm that they did. While free speech is important, should anyone be allowed to use that right as justification for their actions if it means creating a platform that enables easy human trafficking? Did Backpage create a market for new traffickers to exist or ones that may have been hesitant to do so before? Again, this issue is so complicated with so many moving parts and tragic aspects that it's hard to fully wrap my head around this. It's also hard to know for sure if they did potentially create more human trafficking because crimes like these exist in the dark to begin with. Back in 2018, when the arrest took place, a variety of sources painted Lacey and Larkin as troublemakers taking advantage of their profitable adult section. Ferrer even pled guilty, writing that, quote, 
I conspired with other Backpage principals to find ways to knowingly facilitate the state law prostitution crimes being committed by Backpage customers. He also pled guilty to money laundering charges and agreed to cooperate against Lacey and Larkin in exchange for a lighter sentence. In the media, Backpage founders seemed to be running an adult website that knew but didn't care about the aspect of child sex trafficking. Although some sources did tell more of the story, remarking on how Backpage helped law enforcement and the perspective of sex workers upset that they were stripped of resources, many simply regarded it as a victory in the case against human trafficking and moved on. Other accusations also came out against the website as the trial went on, with authorities claiming that Backpage employees would actually quote, identify prostitutes through Google searches, then call and offer them a free ad. However, the tide seemed to turn a bit when in September, 2021, a mistrial was declared. According to ABC News, this was because prosecutors continued to reference child sex trafficking despite no one actually facing this particular charge. They'd been arrested for pimping or conspiracy to commit pimping. So to continually imply that the founders were trafficking kids, it does sound like they were just going really hard on an emotional response from the sound of things. Alexandra Yelderman, a visiting assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame Law School, noted to the Daily Beast and stated, This is not a trafficking prosecution. This is a case where allegations that the founders facilitated prostitution were an impetus for the government to take aim at the entire swath of speech. The argument could be made that this is sort of like when Al Capone, a notorious gangster was caught by the IRS. You take what you can when trying to arrest massive criminals. On the other hand, if Backpage was guilty of allowing child trafficking, then why not prosecute them for that? Why was it so hard to prove this that they aren't guilty of allowing these crimes or because the government is conflating it with consensual sex work? A retrial date was originally set for February of 2022, but that's been postponed as appeals are in the works. As of writing this, the litigation side of things is dragging on and I don't have any meaningful updates, though hopefully things will change with that regard soon. How this case will be resolved, I have no idea. Lacey and Larkin are currently under house arrest and we'll just have to wait and see how things develop. Now, since Backpage has been taken down in 2018, this leaves the question, has sex trafficking gotten any better? And I should clarify by any better, has it become harder to do? Have the numbers and statistics decreased? Kamala Harris and others fought so hard to remove Backpage and painted them as the largest sex traffickers out there, implying that without them, sex trafficking for children would be greatly reduced. So is that true? And before we get into some of the more recent fallout and taking a look at those numbers, I'm gonna go ahead and place today's sponsor here. There was really no good place to put a sponsor in this episode. So I just tried to put it as far towards the end of the episode as I could. So I'm sorry about that. There's no good placement here, but I had to place it somewhere. So ta-da, a quick refresh for a couple minutes before we jump right back into this. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by huge wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard of Mint Mobile offering premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, where's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service for like a year and a half or two years now, it all makes perfect clear sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet, sweet savings back to you. One of the great things about Mint Mobile, as you guys know, I've been using them for like almost two years at this point, is I use them for my work phone and for some of my employees' work phones too. And we all have this little family plan, so it's easy to pay the bill every single time we have to renew. And the service is fantastic. We don't have issues with dropped calls, text messages, issues accessing apps. Like it's awesome, it's easy, and it's, I mean, I don't wanna say it's fun to use, but like compared to what I'm used to doing, It's kind of fun to use because you get the cute little fox popping up and everything, big fan. So for anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless at just 15 bucks a month. And all plans are gonna come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And of course, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Or if you wanna go totally new and wipe the slate clean, you can do that too. So to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, make sure you go to mintmobile.com slash casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash casket. Today's episode is also sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Now, especially because of the pandemic and everything else that's following, shopping online just kind of seems like the safer way to do just about everything. So I use it a lot and I'm sure many of you do as well. So when you go to checkout, there's always that little section. that's like, hey, do you have a promo code? Enter it here. And I'm like, I don't want to check my email or I don't remember or I don't know, or maybe it's just my first time shopping there. But I mean, hey, if I could get a discount, why not? Well, the manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best ones it finds to your cart. 
Recently, D and D session because, as many of you know, for those that play D and D, D and D sessions are never on time. They're never prompt, and they're never scheduled regularly because something always happens. But when it does happen, we like to order pizza. And did you know that Honey can save money on D and D pizza nights or whatever you want to order pizza for? Well, it can. And I ordered, and I got a 20% off coupon by using Honey. So thank you, Honey, for saving me 20% on D and D pizza nights. So it was super easy to use. It just popped up, took a couple seconds, and then voila, code appeared. And Honey also works. You just activate it on Safari on your phone and then save on the go. So if you don't already have, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. And I'd never recommend something that I don't use. And I've been using Honey at this point since, ooh, 2017, 2018, somewhere around there. Very long time, way before they sponsored me. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash casket. That's joinhoney.com slash casket. As the NCMEC numbers were cited earlier when we spoke about reports going up, I looked at their data again to see if reports had gone down in recent years. In 2019, they received just under 17,000 reports of CSAM or child sexual abuse material and almost 12,000 reports of suspected child sex trafficking. In 2020, those numbers jumped to 21,000 and over 15,000 respectively. Just last year, they climbed even higher, 29,000 reports of CSAM and over 16,000 reports of child sex trafficking. Remember earlier when we listed the number of cases that existed from around 2013 to 2017? Well, it was only about 10,000 back then to refresh your memory. Now, clearly it's not as if putting an end to Backpage meant putting a stop to these crimes. Otherwise, these numbers would go down and there would be a very clear correlation. While it's not as if politicians that advocated against the website claimed this would end the problem entirely, they did imply that it would be a great victory. But how? Where's this evidence of any sort of win or anything truly improving? Delmarva now reported that in 2017, Maryland State Police were able to come in contact with 113 trafficked victims, but the next year when Backpage was seized, the number dropped 38% to just 70 victims. Their related arrests did go up, but the level of safety for sex workers and their conditions have dropped as there are no other places that they can safely advertise. Earlier, I mentioned that I never see Facebook, Twitter, or any other websites being so cooperative and willing with law enforcement. And I honestly have to wonder if it's because they're scared of being held liable. After all, Backpage's cooperation didn't save them. This case sends a clear message that if there's sex work being advertised on your website, your best bet is to just erase it completely, hope that no one finds out and that you aren't held accountable. But surely this isn't where things just end, right? Politicians and lawmakers cared enough to stop sex trafficking and illegal sex work that they created FOSTA-SESTA and shut down Backpage. So clearly they were going to continue these efforts against trafficking and take real action, right? No, this is the problem that many sex workers have had with Kamala Harris and other politicians. For example, although Harris went hard on Backpage, making lasting permanent changes within the sex industry doesn't seem to be on her agenda. Back in 2008, she opposed a San Francisco ballot measure to end prostitution arrests, saying that it would quote, put a welcome mat out for pimps and prostitutes to come into San Francisco. Now, when asked if she supports decriminalizing sex work, she says, I think so, I do. People can absolutely change their minds, but she hasn't committed to her position either, seemingly preferring the Nordic model, which targets pimps and those who purchase sex work without going after those who sell it. The Rolling Stone states that the Nordic model further stigmatizes sex workers by operating on the basis that none of them actually want to be a sex worker and they're coerced or pushed into it when this isn't necessarily the case though this is an entirely different debate altogether and yet another complicated issue. Alex Andrews, the co-founder of Sex Workers Outreach Project Behind Bars, also told The Nation that Harris helped the Oakland Police Department cover up a lot of the misdeeds that they were doing in regards to sex trafficking. More specifically, this was in reference to Celeste, an underage girl who had been in sexual relationships with multiple Oakland police officers when she was as young as 14 years old. As she was underage, she couldn't consent and these officers were raping her. They later insisted that they had only been with her when she was 18, that it was consensual and that they hadn't paid to be with her. Kamala Harris said that the case was on her radar, but was essentially letting law enforcement investigate themselves, saying that she'd only get involved if things weren't handled properly. And frankly, it's just a hard pill for me to swallow to know that Harris claims to be such a fierce advocate against trafficking. Yet when this case was right in front of her, she backed off. And not only did she back off, but she let them investigate themselves. Like, and I'm just gonna be honest here. If you had the power and authority to investigate yourself for a potential crime, would you actually find yourself guilty? Because, you know, I think we know where this is going. Susie Q spoke to Reason TV about her thoughts on the matter and summed it up pretty eloquently when she said, No one cares about sex trafficking victims more than the community where they come from. You know, (laughs) like 
piss in my mouth, but don't tell me it's raining, right? Like criminalize the industry, throw us in jail, but don't tell me because it's your, it's your, because you're trying to save us and make it better and make it more safe. You know, I think that's what's most insulting about this whole can of worms. And I think this is pretty fairly stated. There is plenty more that could be done about Backpage. All the lawsuits, the hearings, there's just so much in here. But I do hope I did do this topic some amount of justice and that you found it interesting. So the question here is, what do you think about this whole scenario and how Backpage devolved? Did they deserve to be shut down? Should their site have been protected by the First Amendment? Did they bring trafficking and sex work into the light or just make it a haven for crime? you be the judge. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm ending today's episode of The Corporate Casket. And again, I hope you did learn something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you're listening on YouTube, make sure that you are hitting that bell notification as you're subscribing so that you can be notified every single time a new episode is uploaded. I'd also like to give a big shout out to all the patrons over on patreon.com slash Illuminati. You guys are obviously one of the nicest community of folks I've ever had the opportunity to sit and hang around and chat with. You guys are amazing. I love you all. I love all your faces, but you guys also allow me the opportunity to create some more risque articles and, and episodes like this because I don't know if this is gonna be monetized or not on YouTube. It's probably not, if I'm gonna be totally honest. And as many of you know, a fair amount of my content doesn't actually get monetized. So I do rely on Patreon and on advertiser inserts to help pay myself and all of my employees. So I wanna thank everyone involved in the process to create this and everyone, of course, who supports me, even if that means just tuning into these episodes, that is also just as important. And I thank you for that as well. But with all of that being said, this is the end of today's episode and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.